Good afternoon from King's College London. My name is Dr. James W. Smith and I'm a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of War Studies. I have the pleasure of organising and chairing this afternoon's special online conference in which King's College London marks 40 years since the 1982 Falklands War between Great Britain and Argentina. I'm being supported today by other King's staff, specifically Dr. David Jordan of the Defence Studies Department based in the UK Joint Services and Command College, Shrivenham, and Dr. Hilary Briefer, lecturer in National Security Studies in the Department of War Studies. This is making this a School of Security Studies wide event, which I think demonstrates the level of interest we have uh, here at King's of the Falklands War. I'm also grateful for the support of the Corbett 100 project that marks the centenary of the deaf British historian, strategist and philosopher of sea power, Sir Julian Corbett. You're about to hear from veterans of the war, serving military personnel, researchers and academics who offer up perspective 40 years across panels covering maritime, land and air operations. This will be followed by a panel dedicated to sample new research perspectives by researchers who are in process of producing new research and scholarship, having recently published or going to publish on a range of topics on the war or related to the Falkland Islands. On an administrative note, the event is being recorded so you can rewatch it at your leisure. And if you're on the live online event audience, please place any questions for our speakers per panel in the question function of the software. Before we proceed today, I'd like to provide a brief primer for the 40th anniversary and also our speakers. As I was thinking on the events that occurred in the South Atlantic 40 years ago, it occurred to me that 1982 is now closer to 1945 than it is 2022. Much has been gained, but also much has been lost about the Falklands War, but it's not been without comment, study or research. The lens or prism of time can offer society, culture, and debate greater perspective, knowledge, and understanding alongside remembrance and reconciliation. In fact, many of the great historical works of military history utilize time and perspective with primary sources that has led to some of the most authoritative and scholarly works on topics you can find. True historians are after all very keen to not execute knee-jerk analysis or responses, but instead gather fact rather than fiction and feeling. 40 years of thought is something worthy of exploring, even if we find the same arguments on display across a range of topics related to the Falklands or far beyond most often thought of shores. This is far more to Britain to discuss than about the Falkland Islands for British people. But as Admiral Terry Lewin and Henry Leach reminded Prime Minister Thatcher in 1982, who we are and what we stand for is the fundamental point. I was particularly keen in organizing this event to be mindful of perspective, somewhat true to the roots of the Department of War Studies that Sir Michael Howard created 60 years ago. Sir Michael, like all historians, stand on the back of works and efforts of others, in particular to military history and military education. This can be seen in Kings and the path can be traced back to Sir Julian Corbett and others in particular retired Naval Captain Sir John Knox Lawton, who in the late 19th century came to Kings as a history professor and strive to demonstrate the importance of military history and its close collection to classical philosophical grounds, the study of society, culture, people, relations between nations, politics, the impact of technological change, to name a few. And of course, the actions of state and the military personnel should be recorded to the benefit of society, statecraft, and of course, military education. After all, experience is all we have when we look to paths ahead. The Falklands War is a pertinent reminder of Britain's strategic experience and global connections in which the national reality is in an island nation and an inheritance of connections and culture between communities were laid bare to the shock and angst of a class of decision, political and policy makers, and even the odd academic who thought otherwise. The easiest example of this was the configuration of the British armed forces and particularly the status of the Royal Navy as an instrument of the state and foreign policy vastly reduced in its role, widely misunderstood. It was on the cusp of a niche coastal service consigned to anti-submarine warfare operations, a servant of the US Navy in the North Atlantic. Britain's global connections and standing of its strategic experience were all basically on the scrap pile. This was a failure in understanding the root of understanding is education, education where the study of history is an important pillar to success 
but also those connections between peoples and the positive things they have inherited and share. After 1945, the hopes of a more peaceful world had, been, had by been 1942 all but been dashed. The clash of great and, great and superpowers, the push and pull of alliances new and old, technological change, and of course, the inevitable impact of an expansion of humanity around the world, and after a bloody half century of the 20th century, meant that turmoil and resolving issues and differences were going to be an arduous one and a difficult legacy to address. In 1982, leaders of a nation chose to distract from the economic and social woes impacting their people, and also influenced by other actors, chose to turn into an act of aggression rather than pursue a path of diplomacy. Sadly, events of 1982 and the path to war and conflict remains all too easy, resonating with events after 1982, even to this day. I think this year in 2022, it's fair to remark with a simple statement that diplomacy, no matter what form it takes, is always a better option than picking up arms and violence. After the 1982 Falklands War, the war continued to cast a shadow over relations between two nations and the Falkland Islanders today. The Falkland Islands remains a place of natural beauty, scientific research, and has a thriving community determined to make a better future for themselves. On that note, I'd like to hand over to Mr. Richard Hislop, the High Representative of the Falkland Islands in London. Thank you very much. Firstly, I'd like to thank you, um, James, and the King's College London School of Security Studies for organizing today's online conference. Now, I have been asked to speak today about the modern Falkland Islands and the progress that has been made in the islands over the last 40 years. However, before doing that, I think it is important to travel back in time to the period leading up to 1982. The economy of the islands was then primarily based around sheep farming and the export of wool and meat. There was not a great future for young people living in the islands at this time. Farming and wool prices were very poor, so the economy was struggling and a lot of islanders were leaving. By 1982, the population of the islands had fallen to around 1,820. Despite these challenges, Falkland Islanders enjoyed a relatively peaceful and happy existence. As we all know, that all changed on the 2nd of April, 1982, when the islands were illegally invaded and occupied by Argentine forces. After 74 days of war, Islanders were able to celebrate their liberation from occupation. That liberation came at a high price, with 255 members of the UK Armed Forces and three Falkland Islanders losing their lives. A fifth generation Falkland Islander recently described to me pre and post 1982 as being a bit like BC and AD in its significance. In the years immediately following the war, the findings of the second, second Shackleton report were implemented. Large farms owned by absentee landlords were broken up into smaller family farms owned by islanders. The UK military presence was strengthened through the creation of the Mount Pleasant complex. The introduction of a fisheries conservation zone and fisheries management regime in 1986 transformed the economy of the islands, securing our self-sufficiency in all areas except defence. Today, the economy of the islands is based around three key areas. Fishing, around 94% of all the fisheries products caught in Falklands waters are now exported to the EU through the port of Vigo in Spain. In 2017, a typical year, 288,373 tonnes of fish were imported into Spain through Vigo, of which 16% with a customs value of 139 million euros came from the Falkland Islands. In the same year, 34% of all the calamari imported by Spain came from the Falklands. In the last year where figures were available, the exports of squid and fin fish generated 154.1 million pounds for the island's economy. Whilst less significant than in 1982, farming is still the second largest employer in the islands and combined meat and wool exports generate around 10.4 million pounds a year. Tourism is an increasingly important contributor to our economy. In 2019, over 70,000 cruise ships and 1,650 land-based tourists visited the islands. Despite the challenges arising from COVID-19, this interest is unlikely to diminish in the coming years. 
If anything, we expect growth to continue. Together, these three sectors contribute 53% of our total GDP, which stands at 228 million pounds. As the economy of the islands grew, so too did the population. Today, while still small in global terms, at nearly 3,500, the population is roughly double what it was in 1982 and growing at a rate of around 3% a year. With growth also came diversity. There are now 60 different nationalities represented in the islands, with Chileans, Filipinos, St. Helenians, and yes, even Argentinians, all calling the Falkland Islands home. The average age of the population is 38, two years lower than the OECD average. The economy of the islands has faced two major challenges in recent years, COVID-19 and Brexit. The economy has been severely impacted by COVID-19. Fisheries, tourism and wool, as I have said, are the main sectors of the island's economy. Global markets in all of these sectors have been disrupted, and in the case of tourism and wool, brought to a complete standstill. At the same time, Brexit and, subsequent, and the subsequent failure to secure the Falklands' continued tariff-free trading relations with the EU has resulted in our exports to Vigo being subjected to tariffs of between 6 and 18% for fish and 42% for meat. This will have an impact on our economy, and already meat exports to the EU have ceased. As islanders have worked to rebuild the islands following their liberation, they have also had to deal with the legacy of war. Several thousand landmines were laid in the islands by Argentina during the war. These mines have impacted life in the islands over the years. It was therefore a momentous occasion when, on the 14th of November 2020, the Falkland Islands were officially declared mine-free for the first time since 1982. At the end of hostilities in 1982, UK armed forces made considerable efforts to locate and clear mines. Unfortunately, several soldiers suffered serious injury and the UK decided to stop clearance and fence off all suspect areas. In the end, over 120 areas were identified as hazardous. In 1997, when the UK signed the Anti-Personnel Mine Ban Convention, the UK committed itself to removing such mines from territories over which they had jurisdiction or control. To that end, the UK restarted clearance work in 2009. The clearance teams, with their Zimbabwean deminers, have destroyed over 10,000 mines and assorted items of unexploded ordnance. This has resulted in the release of over 2,338 hectares of safe ground back to the community. Around 15 of the Zimbabwean deminers and their families have now settled permanently in the islands. The Falkland Islands are proud to be a member of the UK family and are grateful for the continued support of the UK in a variety of areas. In March 2013, 99.8% of islanders on a turnout of 92% voted in favour of remaining a self-governing UK Overseas Territory. As the Falkland Islands has developed into an internally self-governing and economically self-sufficient Overseas Territory of the UK, our relationship with the UK has transformed from one of dependence to one of mutual benefit to both the islands and the UK. Whether it is providing a base for the UK's armed forces in the South Atlantic, providing opportunities for UK companies to participate in major capital projects in the islands, playing a significant role in helping the UK tackle climate change, or being home to a significant proportion of the UK's biodiversity. The Falkland Islands should be seen as a vitally important asset to the UK in the context of a global Britain and the focal point for UK activity in the region. Today, there are on average 1,000 UK Armed Forces personnel based in the Falkland Islands at any one time. The islands provide the UK with a stable and reliable base in an area of the world that is of growing significance. As well as providing a deterrent force and protecting islanders' right to self-determination, the Falklands provide the UK with a unique training environment for UK military personnel. From the Falklands, the UK is able to deter military aggression against the South Atlantic Overseas Territories, as well as promoting its wider interests in the region. HMS Forth and a Royal Air Force A400M Atlas aircraft based in the islands are used to monitor fishing activity in the Southwest Atlantic, 
In 2021, HMS Forth was used to deliver COVID-19 vaccines to the British Antarctic Territory and the remote territory of Tristan da Cunha. With access to Latin America limited by COVID-19 this season, the British Antarctic Survey have used the Falklands as their gateway to conduct operations and scientific research in the Antarctic with logistic support being provided to both the new Royal Research Ship Sir David Attenborough, registered in the Falkland Islands, and the Royal Navy Ice Patrol Ship, HMS Protector. The Falkland Islands enjoy an increasing role globally through bilateral engagement and active membership of a number of international fora. As a result of this engagement, we are pleased to welcome politicians and government officials from across the globe to the islands. In 2020, we were proud to host the Commonwealth Women's Parliamentary Conference and the Red Ensign Group Conference. Each year, we see an increase in the number of scientists, environmental researchers, international journalists, media organizations, and tourists wishing to come to the islands. As an example, in 2021, Lufthansa flew two large groups of German polar researchers to the islands from Hamburg. As a government, we are keen to develop this and to establish the Falklands as the gateway to Antarctica, not just for polar research institutes from Europe, but globally. Respecting the Falkland Islands' globally significant biodiversity and unique environment is at the forefront of all we do in the islands. In recent months, the islands have been declared key biodiversity areas for both say whales and for nine species of breeding seabirds. Our energy strategy echoes this, with over 19% of energy in the camp coming from renewables and 35% in Stanley, with a plan in place for the islands to be 100% renewable by 2050. Whilst the Falkland Islands enjoys positive relationships with a number of countries in the region, relations with Argentina, Argentina continue to be difficult. Whilst considerable efforts have been put into improving the relationship in recent years, most notably the 2016 joint communique, the threat to the islands posed by Argentina's sovereignty ambition is still real and poses a significant impediment in a number of critical areas, including economic growth and the protection of biodiversity. Despite these challenges, the Falkland Islands government, working with the International Committee of the Red Cross, have continued to support work in the islands to identify Argentine war dead, to provide them with named graves and to allow their families to visit the islands. Today, the Falkland Islands are internally self-governing and self-sufficient in all areas apart from defence. Our relationship with the UK is modern and mutually beneficial partnership based on the principle of self-determination. Islanders enjoy a good quality of life with growing resources devoted to health, education, and preserving and enhancing the environment. Our population is growing and unemployment is less than 1%. Given the material threat posed by Argentina, the one thing we cannot do and unlikely ever are able to do on our own is to sufficiently defend the islands. We therefore rely on the UK for this, and Falkland Islanders continue to be profoundly grateful for the strong support and commitment of the UK government in protecting our sovereignty. This last point is critically important. None of the positive developments that have taken place in the islands over the last 40 years would have been possible without the sacrifices made by so many in 1982. Falkland Islands will be forever grateful to those who restored freedom to the islands in those dark days. I hope you will agree with me that islanders have not wasted the freedom that was won for them. Thank you. Richard, thank you for your, your time today. I think uh, any King student is almost well aware of, of sort of the Falkland Islands because of course the, the office is only a few doors down from the mm. main King's building. So. Um, our students sort of are always passing the front door as it was, so it always seems that uh, we're neighbours. But um, a sort of one thing that I wanted to pick up was the during the COVID crisis, of course, every nation sort of looked very inward. And there was almost that we never heard anything about what was going on in places such as the fog lines when it came to COVID. Was that something that the island sort of weathered quite well? I know obviously we, the, the, the supply of vaccines got down in the end and, and the Royal Navy helped with that. Um, but, but obviously the impact on that, presumably the islands being very isolated there was quite considerable. Um, yes, I mean, we, we, the commercial flights from South America um, ceased and the pattern of flights with the South Atlantic Air Bridge changed to just one a, one a week. 
after a short period where there weren't, there weren't any flights. But I think the islands, in comparison to the UK and many other places, um, have fared very well as a result of COVID. No one became serious, apart from one, one member of the UK Armed Forces, a Gurkha, and no one became seriously ill in the islands. Even, even that person recovered fully. No one has died of COVID um, compared to many places. You know, we, we, we are very, very fortunate. Um, whilst it was difficult at times compared to other places, I think it would be unf unfair, you know, to say that we, we, we had a, a tough time compared to many. We, we got off very lightly. But we were able to, you know, to play a small part in helping others, for example, with cruise ships that were stranded who couldn't go into um, South America. We were able to bring them into to Mare Harbour um, and then fly, fly the, the um, passengers home and things like that. But no, o o overall, we um, have fared very, very well uh, over the last um, couple of years com compared to the majority of places. Thank you, Richard. I, I'm sure we will talk again. Um, and certainly, I, I know we like staying up to date with the, the Falkland Islands within the department, and I'm sure we'll, we'll be talking again about the Falkland Islands and, and Falklands War. Thank you for your time. Uh, I'm now going to hand the floor over to uh, our very own War Studies Professor, Professor Sir Lawrence Friedman, whose work needs little introduction, a vast array of scholarship that includes being appointed in 1997 the official historian of the 1982 Falklands campaign. Thanks very much. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be introducing the conference, uh, uh, looking back over what's happened over the last, uh, how, it, how it seems 40, from a 40 year perspective. Um, going back 40 years, we were between the Belgrano and the Sheffield, um, and uh, in a sense a pivotal moment in the campaign. We're also, of course, looking back um, with, with a, a major war underway uh, at this time. And uh, it does colour perspectives because it reminds us quite a bit of what was very specific about Falklands, uh, what was different uh, this war to, to um, other uh, conventional campaigns and certainly the one that's going on at the moment. Although, of course, um, when uh, the Russian ship, the Moskva, was sunk, uh, there was a lot of looking back to the Falklands uh, to make the comparison with the Belgrano. This was sort of, well, as if this was almost the biggest event in, in naval warfare since. Uh, what I thought to doing on, on that sort of note is, is to make the comparison. What was very what was particular about the about the Falklands? Why does it stand out not only uh, as an episode in British political history in the Falklands? history and Argentinian history, all of which are very important, but as a, as a rather particular sort of war to, uh, to cover. The first thing that, that obviously is striking is uh, just how logistically challenging it was. This was a war that took place 8,000 miles away, uh, a few hundred miles from, from Argentina, and everything was conditioned by the logistic challenges. It, it was a remarkable feat of logistics, even, even to be able to conduct the war, helped obviously by the fact that uh, we have this island, Ascension Island, that, 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 that made a lot of difference. And also, I think by the initial decisions that were taken um, uh, when, the, when the task force was set sail, um, that uh, no doubt Michael Clapp will remember very well about basically getting in as much as you could into the ships before they left, rather than uh, having to catch up later with extra kit that that had to be done as well. Uh, it was also supported by the um, by the Americans. Uh, initially, they were quite important in, pro in providing fuel, although the uh, equivocation of the apparent equivocation of the Americans about whether or not to support the UK wholeheartedly diplomatically, uh, right from the start, the, the Americans uh, did give uh, a degree of logistics support, and of course, uh, also the availability of all those ships to take up from trade. So beyond anything else, this was a war that was made possible by a remarkable logistics achievement, uh, but was still limited by what both sides were able to get to the island. The second thing 
that it, that, that is striking, the fact that it was contained, um, is the fact that, 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 that Richard has mentioned. Uh, if you were comparing and contrasting uh, the Falklands and the Russo-Ukraine war, the first thing you would comment upon um, is the impact on civilians. Uh, the, the, the three Falkland Islanders were killed was I mean, an unfortunate uh, result of, of, uh, of uh, friendly fire. It wasn't the, the fault particularly of the Argentinians other than the fact that they caused the war in the first place. Um, whereas when we're looking at uh, Ukraine, we're dominated uh, in our understanding of the war by the impact um, on, on civilian life and property. Uh, not just because the war is fought in and amongst the people, but because of deliberate acts of strategy. Now, if you talk to Falkland Islanders about the war, they weren't particularly happy uh, at all about um, the initial treatment and uh, the attitude. But overall, um, there's no comparison between what happened in Stanley and what happened, let's say, in, in, in Boucher, uh, and even making the comparison uh, underlines the point. Um, and that had important consequences because um, although there was uh, a lot of loss of life and there was a degree uh, of angst and bitterness after the war, it wasn't as hard to restore diplomatic relations um, between the UK and Argentina as it might have been if, if a war had been fought um, with the same sort of viciousness. It was a war unusually contained to the forces that were fighting it. It was a war between combatants, uh, between regular forces. Um, and that had, uh, in, in, it, it was a professional sort of war. Um, the, 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 um, the UK forces didn't involve, uh, didn't involve conscripts uh, and their performance reflected their, their training and their doctrine and their equipment. Argentina did have conscripts involved uh, uh, who, to, 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 in their own way, fought, fought quite bravely, not always well led. Uh, but it was uh, a war between professional armed forces. Uh, it didn't involve militias uh, and, it, and it didn't uh, 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 spill over in, into uh, attacks on, on civilians. The third element, um, was the role of allies. Um, again, a similarity with, with, with Russo-Ukraine war in that the, um, the belligerents were, were fighting on their own. Um, they had support, they had backing in a number of ways, the UK more than Argentina. Um, Argentina's support tended to be more rhetorical rather than material, the, the, the British got support from its allies, more so as the war went on, but from say a country like uh, France, um, uh, almost straight away, uh, the, 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 I think what surprised quite a number of people is, is how more robust the French were uh, than, the, uh, uh, than the Americans. Uh, the Mitterrand uh, was quite, Anglophile, uh, he uh, the, the French provided um, information about the Mirage. Um, the Mirages allowed the Harriers to train again to, to train against them, uh, and though they provided Superintendent an X set, uh, and of course, if the uh, Argentinians just waited a bit, they'd have had more Superintendent an X set. Uh, they um, uh, they stopped any more getting to Argentina during the war, which involved some very delicate diplomacy, for example, with Peru, which was supposed to be getting their own. So you have uh, a very particular uh, role of allies, but they weren't belligerent, they weren't doing the fighting. Uh, and though at one point there was a suggestion from the Pentagon, the Pentagon of course was, was following a completely different foreign policy from that of the state, State Department and the White House, uh, and there was talk at one point of providing the UK with a carrier. That was never particularly serious, um, but the, there was a lot of practical support nonetheless. Intelligence, another example, where uh, uh, the, the role of 
allies was was very important, but they weren't belligerent. A further factor to take into uh, account is the um, is the role of the United Nations. Um, I remember getting into discussions not long after the war, and one of the things that was um, I thought was was interesting and unique was that this was um, this was a war in which the UN was playing quite an important role from the from the start, and that was because it wasn't a cold. Though this was a time when the Cold War was quite intense in the early eighties with the Reagan administration and uh, major challenges being posed to to, to the Soviet regime, um, both the UK and Argentina. Um, were, were, were friends and, and allies of, of the United States, which is one of the reasons it created such difficulty for the United States. Um, but, that, but the consequence uh, of that was that it was an issue that could be handled in the UN. There was always a question as to whether or not, just because the UK was on one side, the Soviet, um, Soviet Union would... Um, support Argentina, but it would have been an odd country to, to support because it was famed for its anti-communism. And although Buenos Aires tried to play the anti-communist, tried to play the, the, the Cold War card um, when uh, uh, as a way of putting pressure on the UK, they never did it with, with great conviction or great credibility because of the stances they'd taken before. After all, the role that they played in, in central um, Central America. So because of this, the UK um, had uh, some freedom of manoeuvre in, in the uh, UN, because we had a veto after all, um, and uh, the, um, the war opened with uh, Sir Anthony Parsons having great success in the UN uh, with a resolution which uh, essentially blamed Argentina for the crisis and the aggression uh, didn't quite go as far as it would have been ideal, but far enough uh, for us to feel that we have the UN on our side and politically that made, uh, made a difference. Um, the U, but the UN, uh, is when one reads the documents and, uh, and, and, the diplom and goes through the diplomacy of the time, the role of the UN as a place where pressure is being put on the UK to agree a ceasefire, perhaps especially exactly 40 years ago when the news of the Belgrano had just come through was intense. And it, it was a curiosity of the time that on the Security Council were the two countries with whom the UK had sort of, European countries with whom the UK had sort of territorial disputes, Spain um, and Ireland. And they weren't always the most helpful in, in the UN deliberations. So in the end, it was one of those occasions when the UK did have to use its veto uh, to, to, to stop a ceasefire resolution going through. So the role of the UN, I think, was always one of the uh, striking features uh, of, uh, of this campaign, which in some ways set the, set the uh, terms for what happened when the Cold War did come to an end. Uh, and the next great crisis where the UN did play a role uh, with the Gulf War in 1990. The UN's role, for example, in the Iran-Iraq War or even um, the Israel-Lebanon War uh, was uh, much less um, impressive. So that, that the, the role of diplomacy were, um, and the UN were, was important. Uh, but also I think this factor that it wasn't quite within the, the, the obvious terms uh, of the Cold War. Now, on the, on the Soviet side, that wasn't new. After all, the, 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 the communist Soviet Union uh, had, be, had skirmishes with the communist uh, People's Republic of China, which had a little war in 1979 with the uh, communist uh, Vietnam, which had been fighting the communist Cambodia and so on. So the idea of internecine conflict amongst the, the, the communist bloc was actually uh, not new at all, but less so within the American-led bloc. Uh, and that did create a lot of the difficulties that were faced by uh, the US 
um, in trying to work out its diplomacy. How uh, again, when one reads the, um, the, the the diplomatic comings and goings of the time, the Americans were much more bothered about this possibility that somehow, because of what the British were doing, the Argentinians might switch uh, switch sides in the Cold War. Though in practice, that was the British view, and and most other views, it was never very likely. I remember actually being told by somebody who worked in the Soviet foreign ministry on the British desk uh, that when uh, when the war was over and, and the Argentinian forces had capitulated, they in fact brought out a bottle of champagne uh, and, and toasted the British success. Uh, so it, it cut across the, um, the, the normal Cold War lines. In terms of what it told us about armed forces, it reinforced views that arguably come back again with the current war. Um, I remember a lecture, and perhaps Julian will remember a lecture he gave uh, at King's a year or so after the war, when I think he, 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 when he was asked to describe the lessons learned, he said, training, training, and training. Um, and I'm sure uh, the professionalism kicked in and made an enormous difference when one goes to the Falklands, one's always struck, um, despite what's said by the, sort of the raw uh, Argentinian conscripts against the hardened British troops. The, 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 uh, the ages on the gravestones are, are, are often teenagers, um, but the training uh, was what had, had kicked in. Um, well, I had a few conversations I had with Margaret Thatcher uh, about the war, and I asked her what the lesson she learned was, and she said everything takes longer than it should. Um, and I think that also, in, in a time of uh, instant uh, uh, diplomacy and instant communications, it's always important to, to have a reminder of, of a time when, although the media aspect of the diplomacy was, was very important news about what was going on took a long time to come however I think the lesson that was learned a lot in the uh, in, in media assessments at the time was um, was the exocet uh, the role of the anti-ship missile or with the Belgrano the, the role of the torpedo um, but the vulnerability of sort of large objects to small items um, was something that was uh, much commented on at the time. And it's a feature of most of these, these wars that uh, what, what is always striking to people is the vulnerability of the big ticket items to uh, small, uh, to, to anti-tank weapons or anti-ship weapons or air defense weapons or whatever. Now, of course, um, the counter uh, uh, the counter to all of this is that the uh, you still need your ships, you still need uh, your tanks, and you still need your aircraft. You can't achieve much without them. Um, but I think that the result of uh, of this war uh, has been to raise all of those issues again. And although the um, uh, the, the, those in charge of armored divisions and uh, and ships and aircraft will point out uh, how little you can do without them. I think the the big lessons are still going to be those that revolve around drones and anti tank weapons, etc. But it, this was a this was what was thought to be the big lesson of forty years ago. Yet still, we built two more aircraft carriers and uh, and carried on building large warships. And so on, because in the end, uh, despite their vulnerability, you wouldn't have been able to mount the Falklands operations at all if you didn't have any aircraft carriers at all. So I think that's a, a debate that, that was prompted then and, and, and will be carrying on uh, now. I think that's um, largely my time up. Um, I think the thought that uh, it's just worth ending on because uh, What's striking, I think, if one thinks over the last 40 years, is that we've had a lot of wars. Um, the UK uh, was involved in 82, then it was involved in the Gulf War, it was involved in Bosnia, it was involved uh, in Kosovo, 
than all uh, Afghanistan and um, Iraq and so on. So in a sense, those who've grown up over the last 40 years have grown up with the idea that war is something we do quite often. Um, it was a real surprise in 1982. Uh, we'd had Northern Ireland, um, we'd had the Malaysia, Malaya and so on, but these had been below the radar for most people. When, when the thing started, most minds went back to Suez in 1956, which had been a shambles. Um, uh, so we weren't used to the idea, actually, of British forces going to war. We were aware of the confrontation, of the nuclear issue, of the Cold War, but not of the idea you might actually fight. And in that sense, it was a turning point, because after that point, uh, um, British forces found themselves regularly engaged in armed conflict. And when they did so, um, in a sense, the Falklands was also a turning point, because it was a point at which the professionalism of the armed forces was recognised. Uh, we won. Um, and perhaps just to conclude with a, uh, an anecdote which um, Michael Clapp and uh, Julian Thompson, I hope, will remember, is after my official history was published and Sandy Woodward wasn't very happy um, about some discussion of the commander range, we had a fascinating meeting, which I wish I'd recorded uh, in my office with, with Michael and Julian and Sandy Woodward going over all the ground about what went wrong with the commander agents, how they could have been improved and so on. Um, and things got quite animated until at one point, Julian turned around to Sandy and said, uh, but Sandy, we won. Uh, and I think in the end, that was the most important point. So thanks very much. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I know you've got a really busy schedule uh, at the moment. If I can grab you before you have to run off. Yep. Um, I'm sure the school administrators will be furious at me when I reveal the slogan for our school conference this year is back to the future. Um, Russia, Ukraine, uh, the European Union, Brexit, the United States, COVID-19, China. Um, a lot of questions and people starting to wonder in, in the British context, is it time that we really overhaul and have a look at British defence policy, foreign policy, we really look at the integrated defence review? Is that all up for grabs now or is it fairly plain sailing as was before? Well, it's never plain sailing. I think the integrated review is held together quite well. I mean, it, it, it said that the big issue was going to be, uh, in fact, the pivot to, so-called pivot to uh, Indo-Pacific, which I think will take actually become more important um, after this war is over. Uh, it did focus as the, as the major security area of Russia. And you can argue that, you know, that the British role in this war is the most, uh, is probably the most influential we've had on a, on a major crisis for a while, simply because we were to the fore in sending weaponry to Ukraine and have taken quite a hardline hawkish position. Uh, and, and therefore find ourselves the butt of, uh, of Russian threats and grumps and propaganda and so on, including uh, threatening some tsunami the other day by releasing nuclear weapons with a we using a submarine that they don't actually have yet. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, there's good. I mean, I think it, 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 when you're in the middle of something like this, it's very, as it was the case with the Falklands, it's very case, very hard to work out the repercussions. And you know, a lot of the unintended consequences of war are those that result from, I mean, in this case, from high energy prices, high wheat prices, and so on, that, that, that are hard to anticipate. The big question is what is what this does to Russia. I mean, Russia, Russia is in the process of being defeated um, one way or the other. It, it, it's, it's a loser in this war. And um, what that means for a lot of the assumptions we've literally been working for the last uh, 10 or so years as, as Russia has been um, uh, becoming more uh, hardline and aggressive and so on, uh, it, it is going to be uh, um, quite significant. I mean, starting to see uh, European diplomats saying, well, you know, if, if it's the case that, that Russia is now a diminished power, why are we getting all excited about increasing our defence budgets and so on? So I, I think the big issues are going to be still going to revolve around post-Ukraine-Russia 
um, and, and in particular Putin's own role. Until we see some resolution of that, it's going to be very hard, I think, to manage a, a further reorientation of British foreign policy. And this is always the concern, isn't it, that we, we sort of worry about, I guess, in war studies, are these knee-jerk reactions. I know when we saw the, the sinking of that Russian warship, uh, you know, everybody was basically saying once again, as we saw in 1982, that, you know, get rid of all navies, get rid of all surface warships, where we didn't know all the facts at the time, we still don't. And actually, there might be a lot more at play of this than simply, you know, warships are well, vulnerable. Yeah, I mean, I think if you look back at the Sheffield, for example, um, which, you know, the anniversary of that too, uh, I suspect with the, with the Moskva, it, it, it's, uh, if you're paying attention, you can deal with these sort of threats. If you're not paying attention, you can get caught out. Um, and this is this is always going to be the danger of drawing large conclusions uh, when the explanations may lie in the quality of the equipment, uh, the, the training, how they're being used. You know, the, the Russian combined arms doctrine doesn't seem to have actually been applied in Ukraine, which is why tanks uh, being picked off uh, in, in such numbers. So I think one one always has to be careful, but you can't avoid but noting the the the, um, uh, the uh, what if you're not paying attention and are in a vulnerable position, uh, what what uh, can be done with, with um, comparatively cheap weapons. Thank you, Sir Lawrence. Uh, I know you're off to do some other talks in the coming. Sorry about that. Thank you, anyway. All the best. Bye. Uh, so now we're going to move to the Maritime panel. Uh, and this is our first official panel, which uh, I also have the privilege of chairing. Uh, this panel will form a mini witness seminar style format where I'm joined with three distinguished former naval officers, veterans of the 1982 Falklands War. And I have had the privilege of working with all their counsel during my years as a PhD student. And I know I, I continue to learn from them and fire reams of questions to them about the Falklands War. So it just demonstrates uh, there is a long way to go before we have anything which, uh, at least I would argue, is a comprehensive history and account of, of events. So first, I'd like to turn to Commodore Michael Clapp, Royal Navy retired, who amongst his long service in the Royal Navy, that saw him working around the world, he was the Commodore of the British Amphibious Task Group, working closely with British Special Forces, the Royal Marines, and of course, naval and often forgotten civilian seaborne leadership uh, to take those fundamental steps to retake the Falkland Islands. Uh, Michael, uh, 40 years has now passed. 1982, a maritime naval-led operation, 8,000 miles from the UK, a massive logistical operation spanning tri-service, civilian seafarers uh, and civilian workers, but a profound shock to a nation and political establishment that after 1945 had been convinced there was little beyond the immediate surrounding waters of Britain uh, and Europe. How does the Falklands War fit into British defence history and, and, and Royal Navy history? What are your thoughts 40 years on or now that you've had time to, to really reflect on it? Um, well, I wouldn't uh, begin to be able to answer that question because I've been retired for, for four, nearly 40 years. Um, but um, I hope that lessons were learned. Um, I'm unconvinced that they were because of my experience after the campaign. Um, and, um, You know, for instance, I wasn't invited to attend any um, debrief, uh, an official debrief, such as um, <clears throat> um, they used to do at the, in, in the Second World War, uh, you sit down and analyze it right the way through. Uh, and I've been left really for 40 years uh, questioning in my mind, whether the lessons of the Falklands were ever learned. Um, shortly after I returned home, I asked a, a captain in the Northwood staff. Uh, I'd had very good relationship with him during the campaign. He was an excellent chap. Um, and I asked him, when will a debrief be held? And he said, we don't need a debrief. 
we won, and that's all that matters. Um, so you can see, no doubt he got this from senior officers, and you can see how the thinking was that, um, uh, you know, just relax, it'll all be sorted out and people will remember and make use of the campaign and things like that, but you don't need to worry about it. Um, I feel that that was very much a huge mistake and I was very disappointed to hear it because there'd been a lot of misunderstandings. And even today, we hear people writing to uh, some of the better newspapers or talking loudly about an event, but they clearly didn't understand why that particular event happened in the way it did. Um, the obvious um, uh, Salah, um, example is the disaster of Sir Galahad and Sir Tristram, uh, which suffered from poor communications and a disobedience by, in a naval view, by army officers untrained in naval cooperation and it wouldn't take orders from a Royal Naval officer or a Royal Marine. Um, it all added to the catastrophe that those were burnt and still suffering. There was an awful rush in getting their equipment out to Fitzroy and to the Welsh Guards who were split and to try and get them to just up. It didn't give us time to get things like uh, the um, anti-flash gear, which we all wore at action stations in sufficient numbers to put on the soldiers <clears throat> were going into um, Fitzroy. Uh, if that had happened, there would have been much less danger from, for the Dick Galahad soldiers in there and very much, many fewer would have been properly burnt. The whole thing was rushed and not well organized. Uh, I have to admit, uh, but it, it was essential to try and get them together as a, as a regiment and to get uh, fire brigade ready to go up in the front line. Um, I'm grateful to Sir Lawrence for many of his comments, which I was going to try and cover, but I, I can save that. So, the, before the, the Argentines started to claim the Falkland Islands, the Ministry of Defence had been cutting the Navy, but disregarding our responsibilities to overseas territories and Commonwealth. And I think this was very clear. It was concentrating on the Central Front, and perhaps it was simply driven by the Treasury. But to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, the cuts to the Navy must have had strong implications. The loss of HMS Ark Royal uh, a short while before suggested to Admiral Anaja that an invasion by them would not be counted. Um, going back a few years, when I was a midshipman, I served in the cruiser HMS Salon during the Korean War. And I learned about the Navy's role in supporting our land forces, mainly by shelling bridges far north of the front line so that train and vehicle transport of stores were disrupted and prevented from supporting the North Korean and Chinese troops. So helping our troops move north. Later, as a Lieutenant Commander during the Indonesian confrontation, I commanded a minesweeper, HMS Puncheston, and found myself once again supporting land forces. We experienced several potentially lethal engagements at sea, but luckily we were never badly damaged or injured by the Indonesians. So what I'm trying to say really is that working with the army uh, was relatively common for a naval officer um, until uh, the days shortly before the Falklands campaign. Um, the other aspect is that the confrontation that uh, Malaysian, Indonesian confrontation that covered um, Malaya, Sarawak, and Brunei and places um, 
did bring home strongly the defendants of our colonies on our armed forces, but particularly the Royal Navy for their defence. And I found that the gratitude of many locals was very encouraging. Later, in 1972, when in command of HMS Jaguar, after two Bara patrols, I was ordered to sail east across the Indian Ocean, and I called in briefly at Tasmania, where I was invited to charity lunch. I was bombarded by questions as to what effect our joining the EU was likely to have on the trade and also the question of defence. How would Australia and other dependencies be affected? Well, I hadn't been briefed at all, and they were concerned about China in particular, as they'd been Chinese had been reported to penetrating Queensland. As I say, I, could, I knew little about the trade, but could only say I was sure that the Royal Navy would do, do all it could to come to their defence and support it if it became necessary, and we hadn't been cut much more, because the cuts were already beginning. When we visited New Zealand, the situation was very similar. And while steaming further east, we called in to a number of islands such as Fiji, Tonga, Cook Islands, the French island Tahiti and Pitcairn. All but Tahiti questioned our joining the EU and many asked about defence. An elderly lady in the Cook Islands asked me if I'd met the Queen. I hadn't, but she very proudly replied, I have. And they'd obviously met in the Royal Yacht. And they, I believe we badly need a replacement for the Royal Family if the Commonwealth is to survive. Many islands that we went to didn't have airfields or any means of defence against a modern technically technical enemy. And so they looked for us for support. Earlier cuts to the Navy's amphibious assault capability had devastated our ability to carry out an opposed assault and actually to re help reinforce um, an island's defence. Our relationship with the Royal Marines had also suffered through lack of joint training and commitment. We were not expected to have to carry out an opposed assault. We were only to practice landing troops on a friendly shore. All this, I felt as a midshipman from Korean days, serving in a ship full of World War II veterans, was chaotic and a tragedy. In 1981, uh, my boss, who was Rear Admiral John Cox, and Major General Jeremy Moore got together and reckoned that Brigadier Thompson, the commander of Three Commander Brigade, and I, as Commodore Amphibious Warfare, should be closer together to get to know each other. My office was on Portsdown Hill, just outside Portsmouth, with the Admiral. Until recently, his title was Flag Officer Carriers and Amphibious Ships, but now Flag Officer Third Fertilla. The original title was a far better one, which included responsibility for Royal Fleet Auxiliary Ships. It was fine to raise with my opposite number when the Royal Marines were based in Portsmouth, but they had been moved to Stonehouse Barracks in Plymouth. So in November 81, changing the plus subject slightly, John Knott, Secretary of State for Defence, visited HMS Fearless during a simple exercise off Brandown Beach um, in Dorset, which was with the army. She and her landing ship Logistic, an LSL, was manned by merchant naval seamen of the Royal Fleet Auxiliary, but capable of being armed with two air defense 40 millimeter Bofors. They were landing tanks and vehicles. 
Not was amazed and said he didn't know that Fearless and her sister ship Intrepid were so capable and thankfully delayed scrapping them just in time. My fourth, first thought was why on earth did the naval staff not try and educate the Secretary of State and other civil servants on the Navy's capabilities and needs? Perhaps they do now, but one wonders. In January 82, Brigadier Julian Thompson, the commander of Three Bacardo Gate, welcomed my staff and me to Number Six House, an old married quarter in Stonehouse Barracks, but at last close to his office and staff. We were, however, still limited in training purely for peacetime operations. But thank heavens for that sensible move. It was just in time and certainly helped us on our, and our staffs to get to know each other and work more easily. An amphibious assault is planned with equal responsibility by the landing force commander and the naval amphibious force commander. But as it entails a naval approach and landing by naval helicopters and landing craft, the responsibility for executing the agreed plan rests on the naval commander. Operation Corporate, as it was called, involved the most distant naval operation in known history. On the passage, it became very clear that the Soviet Union was taking a close interest. They were flying air reconnaissance and a possible submarine was found when we were leaving Ascension Island for the route south. But I wondered how much, if anything, if at all, they supported Argentina. The Argentines also showed a close interest, quite clearly, in sending ships to see what we were up to on our way down to Ascension. We attempted various ruses to mislead their intelligence, but inevitably it comes clear where the group of ships are in general heading. To achieve any degree of surprise, we were forced to approach St. Carlos water by night and hopefully be able to land most of the landing force before the Argentine air crew could be briefed and attack us. This was achieved, but it very soon became clear that several naval officers and ratings were, just, were not yet adjusted to fighting. Some of them whinged quite hard and asked to be returned home. Others, thank heavens, were quite excited and got on with it and they had taken the Queen's shilling and they felt that they, it was their duty to do so. I can remember on the first day while we were there, the starboard Bofors crew in Fearless failing to fire as ordered at an Argentine light aircraft flying overhead. It was lucky to escape and report a number of ships it had seen. But a petty officer standing by the gun told the gun's crew to obey the order to fire, which they did, but rather too late. It was that sort of state of training and understanding of the situation we were in, uh, which was obvious initially, but then people started to learn and accept it. <clears throat> that after in, afternoon, an untrained Argentine Air Force came out in force. They were reported to have made about 60 attacks. Their lack of knowledge on how to attack a ship became clear to me as a buccaneer observer who had done lots of it. Most bombs were dropped too late for their fuses to unwind. But that, of course, didn't stop the bomb crashing through a ship and often creating considerable damage. All in all, the campaign was a great success, but the lives lost tell a tale. Two thirds were lost at sea, as ship's weaponry was mostly designed for deep water in the Northeast Atlantic and not for inshore waters with land cl close by, cluttering ships' radars and making detection of aircraft and aiming at them impossible. 
everything had to be manual. While the Sea Harriers and ground attack Harriers were a great success, the lack of airborne early warning, which had gone with the Ark Royal, um, their radars meant that early detection of ships and aircraft was extremely difficult. So the warning we had was really when we saw the aircraft crossing the hills about to attack us. Fortunately, when I first saw the list of ships I was to have to carry out the operation, I was concerned that there were no minesweepers. However, the staff officer in Northwood I spoke to with managed to get three teams of mine clearance divers sent to Ascension to join us. One was sent on to the carrier group where a tug repair and logistics facility a, called a trala was being created basically out of range of shore-based aircraft. The other two came to my task group and these two teams managed to remove some 11 unexploded bombs and so save 11 ships. It was an extremely dangerous task, but they were very successful and immensely brave. The awards I managed to get them, unfortunately, in my view, did not reflect their bravery or contribution to the campaign. General Moore had also tried to get a VC for at least one of his Marines, but he told me he'd spoken with a senior officer, naval officer in the Ministry of Defence, who had said to him, there'll be no VCs for those in the naval service as it was too short a campaign. And all your recommendations are for men that are still alive. Live VCs are a pain. Not surprisingly, General Moore was furious and I was appalled and embarrassed because the man was a naval officer. Over the years later, I heard of other acts of bravery that had not been reported when I tried to upgrade, and when I tried to, try to upgrade some awards several years after the campaign, I was told that there would be no further awards after five years from the incident. There's a marked difference between the land and sea forces. In the Marines and soldiers tend to be part of a family or regiment, a commando, and keep in touch for several years. While a sailor belongs to one ship for about 15 to 18 months, and may never meet those shipmates again. Few brave men talk or boast about their experience, while others suffer mentally through lack of support and some get PTSD. So I very much hope the five-year rule will be canceled and we can go back to a more, a kinder system. So that perhaps describes the civil service in the mods understanding of what bravery involves. The greatest mistake, I believe, was that after the surrender, we didn't sit down and discuss the operation in detail. Most of my, the, expect, the mistakes that affected my task group were due to a lack of understanding of naval problems by the soldiers and their acceptance of naval orders. This was a very different army to that in South Korea, who many of whom had been working and knowing that the Navy supported them. <clears throat> it also strengthens the argument for our senior in theater commander who we badly needed. He might have been able to stop many in misunderstandings and acts of disobedience. Julian and I were in many ways too Julia, junior and far too busy to spare the time to do that sort of work. It also explains why the Royal Marines were created over 300 years ago. And while I believe we need a second Royal Marines Brigade, while China and Russia are supporting many countries 
such as Ar Argentina and their claims for territory, we need to be able to cover operations in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, as well as the Atlantic. Which of our overseas territories will be next? Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I will now turn to our second panelist, Major General Julian Thompson, Royal Marines retired, who commanded three commands of brigade during the Falklands War and distinguished military historian. Uh, Julian, the Royal Marine Commandos, an integral part of British defence, the Royal Navy, but also British national identity and culture over the centuries. By 1981, their future was seemingly in doubt as amphibious operations were deprioritised, as Michael mentioned. Uh, and, but here we are 40 years later where the Royal Marines have carried a significant burden and cost in British defence after 1982, the Gulf, Special Forces, Afghanistan and many other tasks. Yet the Falklands War was almost that typical operation that would be dissimilar to a Royal Marine, such as found in the Age of Sail under Lord Nelson, or the First World War, uh, which the Falklands Islands were, were certainly involved with, and of course the Second World War. What did this mean for the Royal Marines and the understanding of their role and, the, and, and how the Falklands is, is part of their heritage and, and history now, but indeed debate about their future? Well, the Falklands War was a turning point for the Royal Marines, actually. Uh, I'll tell you a little story. Uh, Robin Pringle, who was the Commandant General uh, before he was badly injured in late 1981, went to Michael Clapp. He, he didn't tell me that himself, but he told me that later and said, the Royal Marines are in danger of being disbanded. Should I just say, right, we'll burn the colours, mix the ashes with wine and march off symbolically, rather like Napoleon's own guard, or do we trickle away and salami slice? And Michael Clapp's advice to Robin Pringle was go now at once with maximum publicity uh, and see what they do about it. And um, luckily, that was never put to the test, thanks in part to the IRA blowing off one of Robin Pringle's legs when it was deemed a bad thing to do to attack the Royal Marines while their Commandant General was languishing in hospital. Robin Pringle uh, get, uh, told me that story himself many years later, and I know that it's perfectly true. That was the state to which the not defense review had reduced the chances of the Royal Marines. Another anecdote, first see Lord on his way back for an interview without coffee with Mr. Knott in Cornwall, called my headquarters in Plymouth and said to me, we will never, the Brits will never do an amphibious operation again. This was in about November or October 1981. And he wasn't exaggerating, he wasn't being silly. It was because the not defense review had threatened to reduce the Royal Navy to a coastal Navy. <clears throat> this had several effects. It reduced the level of our deterrence, and obviously been noted by our enemies in, in Argentina. And it meant that the Navy were not going to do anything other than be a coastal Navy. And it was a disastrous uh, decision made by uh, Mr. Knott. And so, that was the legacy which Michael and I inherited and had to make do with uh, when we went south. Now, fortunately, the Not Defence Review was only two years before the Falklands. And so a lot of the damage had not been done. There hadn't been time for it to be done, like getting rid of the carriers and the LPDs and uh, reducing the, the, the Navy to a coastal Navy. And a lot of the expertise, certainly in the Royal Marines, had not been allowed to wither away. I mean, all my staff were still very au fait with all the things we had to do for an amphibious operation, even quite junior ones, because we had not uh, been away from our proper trade for too long. And I think one of the things that comes out of this war uh, that people don't realise, or the general public don't realise, is that it was only one by the maritime power of Great Britain, and by maritime power, of course, I mean not only the Royal Navy, but I mean also the Merchant Navy and indeed the Fleet Air Arm as well. And without that maritime power, we'd not have won. And this reflects itself a lot in the sort of stuff that you see in the newspapers about the Falklands, where they are just concentrating mainly on the land battles, forgetting the importance of the sea. 
because this campaign, I was, the analogy is very much the American Pacific experience in, in World War II, where you are fighting on a small island surrounded by sea, and you owe your survival to the Royal Navy, or in the case of America, the United States Navy. Uh, it's not like a landing in Normandy, where after a while, everything reverts to being a land war, and the Navy takes a pace backwards and just becomes a sort of convoy organization shuffling goods and, and stuff forward. An island war has a different flavor to it. And people don't realize that, I don't think. And partly, I think, Michael again put his finger on it, was though there's now been lessons learned of the Falkland Islands published, a little slim pamphlet, there's nothing that I know of, and I may be wrong, to equate with the Admiralty battle summaries that were written during the Second World War, covering all the major operations. And if you want to look up Sicily, go to see the Admiralty battle summary of what happened in Sicily. And it analyzes the whole thing uh, in, in considerable depth and in, in considerable detail. And this <clears throat> was partly what Michael said of this, oh, well, never, it'll never happen again syndrome, which I was told, I might say, by uh, the, the first, the later first sea lord, uh, some years later, saying the, the Falklands was an aberration, we'll never do it again. Now, this attitude, I think, was very damaging, and was also uh, damaging was the, the Navy's reluctance to publicize its role in the war. I, I feel this is the, 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 the lack of proper PR policy in the naval service, and it may well be happening today, I don't know, but it certainly was a fact in, the, in, in those days. And so, and part of the attitude was summed up by the business of the VCs, which I'm not going to grind on about, but Michael just uh, covered it very, very well indeed. I think the other point I, I, I'd like to make is that the Army and the Royal Marines had, had had a lot of experience in fighting small wars uh, in Northern Ireland and all over the place. This meant that the level of uh, leadership among the junior NCOs and the corporals and the young officers was high because they had experience. Uh, and this certainly paid off in, in, in the Falklands, where night attacks often became just individual battles and individual uh, assaults run by corporals and indeed Marines and soldiers themselves. And this was the experience we had, which helped us enormously. Um, I didn't think I got anything else to say, except that in a way, we are seeing this again uh, in, in what was happening in the Ukraine. I think, or we're dangerous seeing it again. I think that our policy of, fitting the threat to the amount of money you can spend is coming home to roost and I hope it is put right fairly soon and quickly because it should be and this is where uh, we get it back to front as I call it situating the appreciation in other words how much money you got to spend okay we're going to do that with that it's quite wrong you've got to actually look at the threat and decide what you've got to do in order to meet it and that is all I've got to say, because Michael covered most of the ground uh, very well, and I don't want to uh, take up people's time repeating what he said. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Uh, I now turn to our third panellist, Rear Admiral Chris Parry, Royal Navy retired, well-known commentator on British defence, global events, and British foreign policy in recent years, and part of the Centre of Geopolitics at the University of Cambridge. Uh, Chris, the Falklands War stands out almost as a Anomaly in post-1945 British politics, defence policy, and uh, indeed foreign policy. Uh, looking back now, how, what are sort of your reflections after 40, 40 years on this? And uh, it, it sort of continues to resonate, doesn't it, for Britain and Argentina, but other nations long after 1982? Uh, even the publicly accessible lessons learned, and I'm actually always cautious and wary of the term lessons learned, was produced with a land view 20 years later after events. Uh, the 1990s, a different period uh, for Britain. The legacy of the Falklands War may be disappearing already by then. 
um, and of course a world that moved on to the Middle East, now the Indo-Pacific. Um, this almost, and then with recent Russia-Ukraine crisis, almost back to where we started in 1945, the West against Russia. Um, and of course the Pacific, the workshop of the world. Uh, how does this, how does the Falklands sort of fit into, into things today? Well, I mean, very simple answer is the integrated review is the uh, natural culmination of what has happened to the Royal Navy since 1982. Um, if it weren't for the Falklands, the integrated review would not be a maritime based strategy today. It would not be reflecting the virtues of global Britain. You wouldn't see two carriers, you wouldn't see a modern amphibious force and you wouldn't see a modern force of nuclear submarines. Uh, the integrated review is the direct anti not from 1980. Uh, it's a complete reversal. Uh, and every time there's been a defence review, and I've been involved in quite a few since then, the touchstone has always been, can we do the Falklands again? And the evolution of the Royal Navy since 1982 has been totally predicated on the fact that we'd have to do a Falklands again. It's maintained our global footprint and presence. It's maintained our global ambition. Uh, and I would say without the Falklands, you wouldn't have an integrated review today that has got over the hiatus of Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, is now looking at high impact, low footprint operations around the world. And I doubt if you'd ever again have had a naval CDS. So if you ask me what the relevance of the Falklands is today, is you look at the integrated review, and that is the direct legitimate son of the Falklands uh, war in our ability to project power, not just 8,000 miles away, but anywhere that global Britain uh, needs it. Now, um, for my bit, what I'd like to do is just highlight a few things that have, for me, come out of the Falklands, uh, not only as a result of my own direct personal experience, but also in reflecting and researching it. Um, and I think there are some general principles that apply here. Uh, I think the key thing in 1982 is that uh, we really needed to have trained for war generally, not for specific contexts. Um, as Mike uh, has already pointed out, we were configured against uh, a North Atlantic scenario that was designed to contain the Soviet Union, its allies. We had to adapt, uh, go down to the South Atlantic against essentially a foe that had first and second generation Western weapons. Uh, we also had to go into an inshore environment when, in fact, we expected to operate in an oceanic environment. That was only possible because we trained for war generally, not a specific context. And yet again, um, you've got to train in peacetime as you intend to fight. The further you get away from that, uh, the less uh, that your policymakers will actually take you seriously uh, and the public won't even pay for it. And one of the things I found interesting when I was in defence policy is the wide gap between the assumptions on which policies and strategies are based uh, and the realities of situations uh, on the ground. And I think that's because national policies tend to reflect consensual rather than objective uh, assessments about the future, the imperatives of steady state administration by the Ministry of Defence, uh, and a sort of strange narcissism that leads to policies and strategies based on what the purveyor prefers rather than what the context demands. Uh, and these features are often compounded by an ignorance or misuse of history, a neglect of hard-won lessons, or, or even a non-identification of them, and the use of simplistic analogies that mask flaws in policy and strategy. Um, and worse still, the resulting strategy is rarely a template for the pressing demands and practicalities of warfare should policy and deterrence fail, and armed forces are actually required to fight. Uh, and it leads to situations where the declared ends of policies and national strategies really balance the ways and means by which they can be put into practice. So what I'm saying simply is if you insert something into your national strategy, you should actually mean it and you should resource it. And this is one of the big failings uh, of the NOT review. It, it was entirely theoretical. It operated in the abstract uh, and frankly didn't fit the situation anywhere on the ground, even in the North Atlantic or in Europe. Now, the issue about training in peacetime, as you expect to fight, has been pointed out by Julian and by Michael, is both the individual and the collective training. Everybody stresses the individual training, but the collective training is the most important. And I think in the case of the Royal Navy in 1982, the training ground is the battleground. And although we hadn't operated 
in the South Atlantic, the conditions down there are pretty extreme. People seem to forget that one day in three was either a four six or, uh, or greater. Uh, now we've been used to operating in the Norwegian Sea across the North Atlantic, the Royal Marines in, in Norway. So it's essentially we've been training in that battleground, but the principle holds true. People forget we actually conducted a really effective anti-submarine campaign. Uh, there was not one ship sunk by an Argentinian submarine uh, in the Falklands. Uh, people say, look, you put a lot of effort into it, but people forget the, um, the idea is not to destroy submarines, it's to stop submarines interfering with what you're trying to achieve. And that was stunningly successful. Uh, people are whinging about the 31 torpedoes that are expended, the 49 depth charges, the 21 anti-submarine mortar rounds. Let me tell you, that costs less than 21 million pounds. The price of a frigate is 100 million pounds. Okay, cheap at the price, I'd say. We've destroyed one Argentine submarine, the other one was ineffective, and we successfully detected and unsuccessfully attacked a Russian submarine on the 11th of May uh, as well. Exocets and chaff. Uh, I think we rather got right around the axle on exocets. And I think one thing that's worthy of research is no ship that managed to fire chaff in the Falklands was hit by an exocet. And I don't think enough operational research was done at the time into the effects of chaff on the missile head. And uh, if you go through the engagements now, you can see that actually the thing was effectively seduced. Unfortunately, in the case of Atlantic Conveyor, that was the biggest chaff cloud uh, around at the time uh, and it got hit. But in the other cases, if you deployed your chaff, you weren't going to be hit by an exocet. So we rather overemphasize that. Um, the other thing I think people forget when they're analyzing the campaign is the Argentinians didn't fly at night. Um, that gave us some good respite to tell you the truth. We're not likely uh, to get that in future. Sustainability, that's been mentioned. Uh, I think what's really important, uh, something that doesn't happen today, is that we sailed from Gibraltar, in my case, from the UK uh, with war stocks. Um, our ships were fully stored for war against the Warsaw Pact, if necessary. Uh, we had a good logistics train, as you heard, and your campaign should always be shaped by your logistics rather than your operational ambitions. We had a good inventory back in our storerooms and at sea in our RFAs. And also we had industrial reach, both in the UK and beyond the United States and our allies. None of this, I think, uh, is in place today. I think the other thing we need to recognize about the Falklands was the very heavy weapon usage that is required to actually achieve an objective. Uh, if you look at the service to air missiles, uh, only one in four actually achieved a kill. Uh, that's a shocking cost ratio if you think about it. Uh, and I'm afraid to say that quite a lot of our weapons didn't actually work. Not really up to the scale of the torpedoes in the German, uh, American and British Navy at the start of World War II, which effectively uh, was the result of actually not trialing them in peacetime. Uh, you didn't realize how they didn't work. You didn't realize how many failures there would be. Japanese, of course, practiced all the time with their long lance and they produce fantastic results as a, uh, as a consequence. Uh, but one of the failings we have today is we hardly ever do missile firings. Uh, we don't know whether they're going to work or not. And I would dare say that most of our weapons would not even leave the rails, uh, given the assurance that we've got. However, having said that, I think one of the real pluses of the campaign is having thinking, uh, as Julian said, uh, NCOs and officers who can improvise uh, and adapt. Um, I think one of the things that we were required to do almost all the time down south was actually say, here's the mission, how are you going to deal with it? So flying at night without night vision goggles below the level of mountains in the dark is doable if you really work hard at it. Uh, and obviously uh, you cross your fingers while you're doing it. Um, but what, I, what disappointed me down south, I think, uh, was the poor corporate memory. It seemed that everything that we were going to do uh, was the result of uh, within living memory. And I remember being in San Carlos on day one, and I'm sure Michael remember it as well, thinking, I wonder if these ships could make smoke. I wonder if we've got barrage balloons back in the UK. Well, the answer was we did. In Abingdon, uh, Abingdon Airfield, there were 400 barrage balloons that we could have used. And what disappoints me as a historian and as a military practitioner is the fact, the fact that we didn't go back to World War II and say, well, if we're going to do an island hopping land assault, what did we use then and what can we use today? We didn't do that. We didn't draw forward 
all those lessons of our forebears. We relied on our own experience and the most recent generation. That is a besetting fault, I think, of all armed forces. They want to perfect the last day of the previous war rather than get ready for the first day for the next, using everything at your disposal. And my final point is, and Laurie mentioned it, uh, we really played our part in a very sterile information environment in the South Atlantic. There were no snooping civilian satellites. There was no social media. Uh, there were no press helicopters and boats. Uh, we would expect to be swarmed over in any modern conflict. Uh, and I'm afraid to say the operational tempo would struggle to keep up with the information tempo. That's me. Chris, thanks very much. I'm, I'm going to slightly abuse my position as chair and, and ask uh, each of our panelists a, a question. Um, but if you do have a question, please put it in the question and answer function and, and I shall try and sift them and ask them before we move on to the, the next panel. Um, Chris, if I can start with you as we refresh off the back of your speech there. Uh, you mentioned uh, the, the lessons learned, um, and, I, and I also mentioned you're always being wary of that term, lessons learned. Uh, I suppose that's the, the skeptic uh, in me, but when it comes to the politics of defence, uh, and how we look to the future of what is national defence. We've seen this constant debate in, in public and parliament, everywhere else of this sort of yawing all the time of what is the national priority here? What is the threat to the nation? We've now seen with the Russia-Ukraine crisis instantly that there is an argument of everything else in the world was irrelevant, focus on Russia, yet we know in the background, and I know you're well acquainted with, there are big questions in the Indo-Pacific, at the, uh, for the future, there are that unknown something in the future. Uh, if Russia is going to be resurgent, I have my doubts personally. How does, say, a member of parliament look at and connect experience, strategic experience, tactical experience, think what we've done before and think I'm going to vote for increasing defence spending or I'm going to support that? When actually, this is a nowadays is a very fluidic, fast-paced debate on what should be British defence policy and, and, and foreign policy. Well, how long you got? Um, um, <laughs> um, right. Firstly, what does the average MP think about the number of votes he's going to gain or lose by every decision he makes? I'm afraid I struggle to get a sensible conversation with most MPs about defence. Um, it's beyond their electoral horizon. They're not interested in strategy uh, because it doesn't really affect you know, their constituents in their view. Um, so the first thing is, um, you know, like the woke people say, we have to educate them. Um, this is a they're very keen on saying it's the, you know, the first the first priority is government is the defense and security of the British people. Well, you wouldn't think so. Um, it's as simple as that. We need better people. I mean, on the naval side, just think how many naval officers are MPs in Parliament right now. Just one. Andrew Mirison, who's a doctor, a uh, medical doctor. How many army officers are there? Quite a lot. So this tends to sort of influence quite a lot of the debate. The short answer to your question, James, is lessons are just lessons. They're only learned when they're incorporated into doctrine or policy. And doctrine is the safe seashore from which we allow people to dive into the sea of initiative and it gives them something to paddle back to when they get out of their depths. Simple as that. Um, and that's all it is. Um, but what we have to do is keep under constant review the strategic context. And I'm one of those people that doesn't believe in grand strategy. Uh, I'm afraid grand strategy died at the end of the Cold War. What we need to teach our politicians now is how to do statecraft, how to manage the complexities of the situation that you outlined, allocate priorities, and essentially balance the ends, the political ends that are required by the government and the public with the means that they're prepared to make available and then discussing with the military the ways in which those ends and means can be, ends can be achieved or those means can be employed. That's all it is. But trying to get that debate coherent, balanced and informed by the right people is beyond the wit of most democracies, I'm afraid. You actually have to have an intelligent conversation with intelligent customers. Amongst the political class, those intelligent customers do not exist right now. Um, and uh, you know, as I keep as I keep saying to them, 
war is too important to be left to politicians. You tell us what the political objectives are uh, and we'll deliver through the means you give us uh, the ways in which that will be achieved. And as I recall, that's exactly what Mrs. Thatcher said uh, to Admiral Fieldhouse and Admiral Lewin. These are my political objectives. Here are the means, get on and deliver them with the ways you know best. That's the best way to conduct war. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I've got quite a bit, an interesting question come in that I'd like to sort of throw out to all three of you, um, which is a key concept in the Ministry of Defence today is that of multi-domain integration. What lessons can the maritime commanders of 1982 offer today's force? What are the likely blind spots? What's meant by multi-domain in integration? It sounds like typical MOD speak, which I'm subjected to when we go to the staff college. Hey, Julian, it, Julian, it means joint with a bit of cyber and space thrown in. Well, why do they say so? Yeah, because they're not you and me. Right. Anyway, sorry, I couldn't resist it. Um, can you ask the question again, please? <laughs> Look, uh, basically, multi-domain in integration means that you have to coordinate <laughs> the effects that you require with the ways and means that are available to achieve them. Yeah. Sorry, realise them. You've got to use the right terminology, realise yeah. them. Uh, and everything is relevant, whether it's in the cognitive space, the physical space, or the electronic space. So it's bringing everything together that you can know and applying it to a realised effect. Thank you, Chris. I knew you'd put me right. <laughs> <laughs> But you're right. I mean, you know, look, basically it's integrating all, all the information and intelligence you require, you know, to gain strategic operational tactical advantage. It's what we were trying to do for yeah. centuries. It's common sense. Yeah. You don't have to give it a, a, a grand name. It's absolute common sense. Yeah. I think yeah, you, don't, you don't get to be the previous CDS if you get, don't make up these terms. No, true, absolutely. And to pick up something that Chris, you did say, which I entirely endorse, I've heard MPs say there is no, there are no votes in defence. It's, it's absolutely ground into them that there are no votes in defence. And I say to them, there'll be some when you've cocked it up so badly we have a war, but it might then it'll be too late. James, can I say something about the Ukraine war? Um, I think you're absolutely right that, you know, We've got to be real, really careful here that we don't go off uh, and say, actually, you know, this proves that the integrated review isn't coherent. I believe with Laurie Friedman here, I think it's very coherent. You know, Britain is not here to defend Ukraine against tanks. We've got the best tank trap in Europe called the English Channel. OK, and we need to leave, leave the panzer stuff to those who need it most and do it best. It's as simple as that. That's not our role. It never really has been. Uh, our role historically, except when we've had to step into the breach uh, for, for other people. But I will say to you that I think the war in Ukraine is probably the last 20th century war rather than the shape of the future 21st century. And I think we've got to get our heads around that. I think the other thing is, is, is taking our eye off, the, I think, the main ball, which is China. Correct. Yeah. And little example. Falkland Islands sit like a bottle stopper on, on the Drake Passage, which is one of the two axes from the Pacific to the Atlantic, other than going a long way around until the Antarctic ice melts, which it will. Uh, and indeed, one of the reasons why the Chinese are backing the uh, Argentine claim to the Falkland Islands is they know they can then sidle up to them afterwards and say, now is payback time for us supporting you. Can we use your port and your airfield in the Falkland Islands? And they will get them, get them into so much hock that eventually they'll have to do it anyway. So they've got their eye on the main chance and they're not taking their eye off the ball. And we've got to be careful we don't either as well. Yeah. Um, Argentina's got more gas, of course, onshore and offshore than three Qatars as well. So the Chinese will be after that. And uh, on that note, we all know that uh, resources are the, and uh, fights over resources is the path to war. So uh, I'm going to ask a question of uh, Michael Clapp. Um, that's, that's come in and, and uh, it reads, 
You mentioned several issues plaguing the operation and your command, namely joint operations and the ability of your forces to understand the joint environment, major operations and littoral environment, radar and maneuver issues, and limited after action reviews. The article, Bluff Cove Disaster, also describes command structure and communication issues. With all this in mind, do they think there was a key to solving these issues before they became evident? Michael. Um, that's um, much, much of that's beyond me, I'm afraid, because um, it was a long time ago. Um, now, I, th I put it down to a lack of joint training. Um, the people I first met in uh, out in Korea and stuff, where nearly always um, the ship's company, almost to a man, had served in World War II. So they were totally relaxed about the whole thing. Uh, most of the army who seemed extremely keen to come out to a ship and take their leave period with us, which was quite fun, uh, because you had a different type of person that chat to, um, and they were questioning the whole time. So looking back at that, the, the services were very integrated in each other's role. They, they tried to learn out, you know, we were trying to learn what the army wanted out of us, uh, bombarding targets ashore and things like that. Um, I imagine the carriers were doing exactly the same, uh, men, uh, mental uh, roundabouts. <clears throat> And um, in some ways, the army were, were doing it in reverse, saying, you know, how can you help us? And what can we do? Because we're the ones that own the property and the land. But, you know, sometimes that's rather difficult to do. And if you can do something rather difficult, different, it's wonderful. Um, and frayed with this sort of concentration on the central front attitude, all that, it seemed to me, had died. Now, whether you can keep it up in a time of peace and make sure the services are um, in cahoots with each other and understand each other, um, I, don't, I honestly don't know, but I think one should try. Um, and I went on to um, become the naval commander at the Joint Maritime Operational Training Center. And it was staggering, actually, to listen to quite a lot of the Royal Air Force people and then total misunderstanding of what maritime operations was about. Uh, uh, I'm not knocking them as air crew, uh, Battle of Britain, that type of campaign. They, would have, they were brought up to think about. But one, of, one occasion they were asking me, why don't you put uh, TACAN beacons out to sea in a position that you can put on your map? And you know, they, didn't, they didn't accept that or didn't understand that a Russian submarine could come along and probably remove it and put it about 20 miles in a different direction. Um, and it would still be working and their navigation would be 20 miles out and put them in a trap. Um, there was, it, you know, I'm not, I was just interested in how limited their view of air warfare was and, the, and naval air warfare uh, was. Um, probably they were bloody good air crew in, in other respects. Um, so I think there's a huge amount for the services to learn about the other problems. Um, whether we do it, I don't know. I never did a joint staff course. I, frankly, I, I never did a staff course. Um, and what they, what they do teach, um, I wish I knew, uh, because I, th I think there's so much more basically childish almost, down to earth, simple questions that people need to understand. Certainly in the Falklands, this became very apparent. Um, when going back to the disaster in 
of, of the uh, Sir Galahad and uh, Sir Tristram, um, it was set up at the request of divisional staff at very, very short notice. And the idea was that Sir Tristram would get in in the darkness and she could just about do most of the passage in the dark and she would meet landing craft there and possibly helicopters and offload the troops in particular first and then the ammunition and the stores that were being delivered. And most of these bits that were being delivered were probably quite vital to Five Brigade. Uh, the only ones I can think of which one could possibly have left behind were the rapier air defense system, which was sent to mark, cover their headquarters, but their headquarters is always on the move. So that's uh, not the easiest thing to keep it covered. Um, but if it had been planned longer, we might have had um, the clothing to protect the Welsh Guards and all the other people involved. Uh, but the time didn't allow this. And um, my first efforts didn't show where any spares could be, probably in the Canberra and the QE2, who had well out of the area by then. Um, and these weren't these may not have been passed down to the five brigade as reasons for why we were trying to do it in this way. They hadn't got their communications with them, which staggered me afterwards to hear it. it had, the communications were all on HF except to seven ships. So you've got the two carriers, the two amphibious ships, HMS Antrim for South Georgia, and the two main troop ships, the Canberra and the QE2, those seven had um, secure voice satellite system. The satellite system was only available because the Americans managed to put up another satellite, I understand. So it wasn't one going around the South Pole once a, once <laughs> a day, it was two. Um, but even so, that meant you did have a system which is like the modern communication system. Every other ship uh, in the whole force, and mostly the troops too, only had HF. Um, recently I was told little incidents, I'm, without knocking the SAS in particular, but they were in, a team was embarked in Hermes, and Hermes had gone for radio silence, but, <clears throat> or despite having the DSSS. Um, so it was limiting them to having to use the leech for this. So, and they realized that some quite close, somebody was using HF. And the officer who told me said he'd, he'd noticed a rather furtive member of the SAS with a little box walking around to the wing of the bridge and sort of talking to it. And for several days, uh, until they really worked out what he was up to, he was transmitting on HF, giving away the place of Hermes nicely, so uh, they could have launched a huge air attack if she'd been in range. It was these sort of misunderstandings, which were fairly common, I'm afraid, uh, in the area. Um, how you train people to accept the rules that others make for you uh, in order to protect them and look after them and get them to the right place at the right time, um, I think is very difficult, but it's certainly one worth a try. Can I chip in here? The, the point mm -hmm. is that joint training had gone out of the window just before this. And when I joined as a young officer, we were very joint orientated because all our predecessors had, had it banged into them be joint, because they had experience in the Second World War, where it, the whole business of jointry was plain sailing. Everyone knew about it. 
And a very good example, when I was at DS at the Army Staff College, the first year I was there, we did quite a lot of joint training with the Navy and the Air Force. My second year, they had started to slim it down and do away with it. And they, you've got to remember also that a lot of places like the Joint Staff College were the joint uh, the, uh, place in uh, Old Serum where they taught the basics of jointery had been disbanded and got rid of. Jointery was out. It was, it was just not part of the scene for the Central Front. And so what Michael is talking about, where it's natural to turn around to your dark blue or light blue chap and say, well, let's work together and what can you do for me, had gone out of the window. And they just, everyone distrusted each other and become on little tram lines without actually being joined. This is the problem, I think. Go along with that. I, I think that's a, a good point to uh, finish on with the maritime panel. Uh, I think I would just add from, from some of my own research that it's particularly interesting that after the Second World War, there was, of course, this huge push for, as, as Michael and Julian mentioned, uh, joint operations and an understanding. But there was also debate going on that there wasn't enough of it. And it was foundational to the creation of things like the Department of Defense and the Ministry of Defense to try and force through more joint operations. But with that came a situation where national strategy went out the window because jointness, of course, was bruited a strategy. And this is something that continues to be a, an element of huge amount of confusion to this day, and this separation there between operations and national strategy. And it was certainly something that Sir Julian Corbett 100 years ago was trying to underline when he discussed national policy and national strategy and where all the armed forces must be working towards a strategy based on our strategic experience which of course the Royal Navy has played a significant and important part in. On, on that part, Chris, uh, Julian, Michael, thank you as always, a pleasure to talk. Um, I'm fairly convinced there will be a lot more to say about the, the naval and maritime part of the Falklands War in the future. Uh, and I certainly know that we have some students researching that side of it here at King's. So I'm sure we'll look forward to talking about that in the future. Uh, thank you very much.